Good morning. I am a great fan of the CAR Conference, and this is a meeting that I've been coming to since I was a master's student. And one of the reasons that I'm such a great fan of this meeting is because of its unique capacity to bridge. And I'm talking about bridging scholars across disciplines. I'm talking about bridging the world of research with activism, and thank you to Richard Elliott for the compelling reminder about this in the opening remarks. I'm talking about bridging people who work within the academy with those of you who work in the real world. I'm talking about CAR's ability to geographically bridge MTV with The Rock. And I want to thank Renee Mashing for introducing me to the, the acronym MTV this, this week. It stands for Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver where many of us do this work, and CAR has the ability to take us out of those major centers and engage with those of us who work in all of the other important parts of this country. And this meeting is unique because it has literally bridged us in this ballroom with our coffee over at the St. John's Convention Center. So, it is my great pleasure to now introduce you to Dr. Virginia Bond, who is herself a highly accomplished bridger. Ginny was born in Kenya, raised in Zambia, and schooled in the UK. Her home base, academically, is at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, but she lives and works in Zambia, where she's a director at Zambart, which is itself a bridging organization. It, it does a research shop that does research on TB and HIV, and also bridges the London School with the University of Zambia. In addition to bridging hemispheres, and British and Zambian worldviews. Ginny's work at Zambart has largely been in the context of, of large-scale clinical trials. And yet her training is as a social anthropologist. So she is a social scientist nested in the world of public health trials. And finally, Ginny's work has, for a long time, paid explicit attention to the bridge between HIV, uh, HIV treatment and HIV prevention. And we've had some nice introductions by Kate Hankins and by Richard Parker yesterday morning starting to point to the complexities of looking at HIV treatment and prevention, HIV treatment as prevention. And what Ginny's going to do for us now is deepen our understanding of the complexities around HIV treatment as prevention by bringing new data to us from work that's coming out of Zambia and South Africa. Dr. Bond. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm my maternal grandfather's Canadian, so it's very exciting to come back to some of my roots. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge um, the teams that I work with in South Africa within the Desmond Tutu TB Center at the University of Stellenbosch and at Zambart, as well as the SEPO2 team that's actually led by Stephanie. Um, Nixon, and also acknowledge the presence of Patty Solomon, uh, another colleague on the team. Um, sorry. Just my conflict of interest slide. So um, today I am going to uh, just quickly talk about the two studies that I'm drawing on to reflect on experiences of HIV treatment and prevention in Zambia and South Africa, and uh, around three concepts that I'm using, um, which I call silos, science and stigma. And I use those concepts to discuss the findings and then to draw some key conclusions about treatment as prevention as a concept. So the two studies that um, I'm drawing on, one was a rapid qualitative research study which preceded a community randomized trial. The other is a qualitative longitudinal study of people living with HIV in Zambia. Um, just to say a little bit about the trial that this, uh, the, the sort of rapid uh, research was uh, related to, um, it, this trial is an HPTN 071 trial, which we most of us call POPART. Um, it aims to assess the impact of a universal test and treat approach on HIV infection in Zambia and South Africa. So the intervention involves lay health workers going door to door in, in 21 communities, encouraging HIV testing 
and facilitating linkage to HIV services, as well as promoting condoms, medical male circumcision, and the treatment of STIs. An early initiation of art is encouraged in one arm of the trial, so that's in seven site communities. So these 21 communities, 12 of them are in South Africa, I'm um, sorry, so in Zambia, scattered across six districts, and nine are in South Africa and Western Cape, um, located in the Cape Metropole and the Winelands. Um, these are all urban communities with population sizes that vary from 160,000 in Zambia for the larger sites to 15,000, and in so South Africa from 66,000 to 18,000. So preceding the implementation of this trial, we conducted um, rapid qualitative research using a broad brush survey approach that I've been involved in developing and used in other trials. And the point of this research was to document the uh, HIV landscape in all these communities. And we were going to, and to use this, these findings both to inform the trial, to interpret the trial, and to develop, to develop future social science inquiry. Um, so field work was conducted for 12 days in each of these site communities. Um, and we used uh, a sort of mix of methods, observations, discussions, key inform interviews with a variety of groups. And today, I'm sort of drawing on a rapid analysis of all this data, but more particularly on a finer analysis that I did myself on the research we specifically did with people living with HIV, with what I call health HIV specialists, which weren't necessarily biomedically trained and involved a range of people that were in a position to be better informed about HIV in these communities, and with local health committees. And this just shows you the range of observation um, that we did in, in different places, both in the clinic and in the community. Um, so there's the CEPO 2 trial, um, sorry, not trial, several choose study, um, is interviewing 35 people living with HIV and on treatment, and it's drawing on WHO's classification of functioning disability and health, as well as the episodic disability framework. And um, the analysis that I'm doing today is based on analyzing the first round of interviews with um, this group of people living with HIV. So this involves uh, 18 women and 17 men, and the average time on treatment is, is about six years. So the pictures behind the analytical frame that I'm using are all from the communities um, in Zambia and South Africa. Um, so I use the concept silos to discuss HIV treatment and prevention in Zambia and South Africa and how they're experienced. And the reason I'm using the term silos is because the concept rose out of realizing that treatment and prevention were not on the whole linked to each other, but experienced as quite differently and each in their own silos. And I draw on Margaret Locke's concept of local biologies just to emphasize that that biology is both material and social and very much shaped by local context. The, the concept science is both to emphasize the kind of biomedical thrust behind treatment as prevention, but also to flag the existence of alternative paradigms. And in medical anthropology, we talk about synchronism, um, which is both the kind of indicating how plural health systems are and when people are trying to manage sickness, they often move between different systems in their quest to get well. Finally, stigma. I think um, it's really important that we document the impact of treatment on stigma, but also begin to understand the early impact of treatment as prevention on stigma, and particularly with that strong focus on the responsibility of people living with HIV to prevent transmission. I think this is a, a sort of widening concern, as Nguyen's um, comment here reveals. So, um, as Janet Seeley um, points out, we need to understand responses to HIV 
within um, the other things that are happening, what she refers to as the uh, broader canvas. And if the human body is complex, so are the social realities um, of these communities. So what we did in order to compare these communities' features, we used a conceptual framework um, which revolves around the four meta-indicators presented here. Um, and just to um, show the kind of mix of informal and planned housing, this is from Zambia, um, and then the next one is from South Africa that, that exist and coexist in these communities. And also that to, to highlight that there's different livelihood activities in, in, in the communities. South Africa is a quasi-welfare state, so many households will be in receipt of maybe one grant, um, but still people are having to um, sort of largely rely on the informal economy um, to sort of to, to get by. In Zambia, there is no welfare state, so people survive, again, largely in the informal economy. And the, these, this photograph shows South Africa um, different enterprises like selling, building materials for houses, or hairdressing, or cell phone um, fixing, and, and other good selling. And the photos from Zambia show traders that go on a day-to-day -day basis sort of two markets come and sell goods back in their community, including vegetables and charcoal and clothes. And the bottom right is uh, stone crushing, which is a livelihood activity in some of the communities um, where the trial is. So it was often hard to get participants to highlight the more positive features of their community. And community action that we heard about from Richard Parker and others at this conference was very highly valued, but some communities are more fragmented than others, and often these fragmentation is along sort of political and racial divisions, particularly in South Africa. Um, but, but they were much quicker, the participants, to point out the sort of daily challenges of, of life and to link HIV specifically to patterns of alcohol use, recreational drug use, transactional sex, crime, and poverty. And drug use and crime, which includes rape, um, was particularly prevalent in South Africa, and poverty was deeper in Zambia. In both countries, youth unemployment and teenage pregnancies are pressing concerns. So participants themselves sort of explained to us how HIV needs to be tackled um, within these wider vulnerabilities. And you can see from these two quotes here, one from an NGO worker that points out that, that this is not a one-dimensional, um, there's no one-dimensional way of dealing with this. Um, and and in, in Zambia as well, they sort of describe their, their sort of how, how in reality do you implement prevention when realities push you in the other direction. So to look first at the silos of, of treatment and prevention, and Susan Kipax uh, cautions us to link the scale of art to treatment rather than prevention. So if, if we look at looking at this data from Zambia and from South Africa, if we focus, focus first on treatment, we see that indeed uh, antiretroviral therapy is not experienced within a treatment frame. When we asked about people's memory, almost like the community memory of antiretroviral therapy in Zambia and South Africa, in, in Zambia it stood aside much more than in South Africa. In, in Zambia it was related to progress in a broader sense and it represented very much a leap from a, an era of unprecedented deaths um, um, to an era where people were living, um, were able to live and be productive. And a lot of suspicions about art that were there initially um, fell away as, as people saw health uh, really drastically improve in people living with HIV and on treatment. However, in Zambia, there are understandable fears about the sustainability of drug provision. 
Um, in South Africa, it was much harder to talk to people about a community memory of art. People rather related it to individual stories and also placed it within a wider discourse of basic service provisions. And in both, both countries, a bit like what, what David talked about, participants speculated on a, on a cure for HIV. Often but people don't talk about antiretroviral therapy as art or ARVs. Um, it's often talked about more obliquely um, with reference to medicine or pills or drugs. And in Zambia, there's a very wide range of euthanisms used to talk about art, which reflect on the appearance, the shape, the visible uptake, the dependency on art, and the provision of art from the government. In both countries, art is widely acknowledged as having reduced mortality and transformed the lives of people living with HIV and of their families. However, starting art in both countries is a lifelong commitment to regularly interacting with strained health systems. And these uh, challenges are listed here on the slide. And I think we need to realize that treatment as prevention could worsen these encounters with public health care services by increasing numbers. Um, in, in CEPO 2, participants complained that long-term clients were dealt with very quickly and it was hard for them to get close attention. And in Zambia, clients who were not able to make appointments were punished when they next came in by being issued with more frequent appointments. And this account from a person living with HIV in South Africa reflects, I think, how counselling, disclosure and consent procedures are imposed on people living with HIV and add steps and time um, to, to the whole interaction. It also reflects the shortage of staff in our clinics, which was characteristic of both countries. So treatment inevitably involves side effects, and in CEPO2, participants distinguish between more short-term side effects related to the start of treatment and more long-term side effects. Um, bodily changes were um, mostly experienced as undesirable because it signified that you had HIV and that you were on treatment. And I think the guilt uh, about missing a dose is evidence in a pattern of people living with HIV attributing side effects sometimes to having skipped a dose. And I think this reflects a very strong adherence discourse, particularly in Zambia, that emphasizes the responsibility of people living with HIV to take their medication. Most participants highlighted that both alcohol and drug use undermined art uptake and adherence. But in South Africa, there was much more tolerance of taking alcohol with medication. And in, in Zambia, this was very strongly condemned. And in some instances, health staff would actually send people living with HIV who they thought was drunk um, home without any medication. In both countries, there is a strong belief, which is very much reinforced by health staff and by families and by food insecurity itself, um, that art should be accompanied by a nutritious diet and taken with food. In South Africa, there is a disability grant that some people living with HIV can access. Um, and there are also sometimes various food schemes that help buffer hunger to a degree. But in Zambia, there is currently no food aid given to people living with HIV, despite food aid schemes in the past um, having proven to have a positive impact on treatment uptake and adherence. Um, uh, people living with HIV in both countries emphasize their awareness of, of treatment being a lifelong commitment and how this made the decision to start treatment um, even harder. Another issue related to treatment in South Africa was the risk of actually being mugged for your ARVs on the way back of, from collecting them. So we heard about this in two Wineland sites, and they weren't able to replenish the stolen ARVs. The, the system wouldn't, wouldn't give them any more. And finally, and but not leastly, <laughs> it was apparent that women living with HIV 
faced additional challenges. Um, it was harder to disclose their HIV status to partners, and that made both accessing and taking ARVs more difficult. There was also considerable pressure on pregnant women living with HIV in Zambia to bring their partners to the clinic to test for HIV. Indeed, many of the clinics considered this mandatory and penalized pregnant women who didn't comply. And there's limited evidence that this is putting women who think they may have HIV or who know they have HIV off attending antenatal care, or that women would bring fake husbands in or purchase counterfeit health cards for themselves and their children. So we look now at prevention and how this is experienced. Kalikman put a very comprehensive overview of what he calls the TASP revolution, which advocates a broader approach to TASP, and I think that's what I've heard again and again at this conference. We use the concept uh, of sort of particular methodology called concept mapping to unravel local understanding of HIV prevention with both what we call HIV specialists and with different age and gender community groups. So we use this method. What we saw is that treatment is very rarely listed under HIV prevention. And if it was listed as taking ARVs or in some other form, it came under PMTC. So some participants felt that prevention was necessary because there wasn't a cure. But the, sort of the, the, the most readily identified prevention strategies was abstinence, behavior change, and condoms, which is referred to as ABC. And the quote from, from is, is quite an unusual example of, of one respondent who made the link between treatment and prevention and said, why don't we just add a D to ABC? Um, so prevention was often recognized as, as, as a combination of options. And, and people saw that the earlier focus on changing and curbing sexual behavior, which was so heavily emphasized in the early 1990s in both countries, was now widely perceived as having ebbed. So this lists the prevention options that emerged through this methodology in both countries. And what we can see here is that education and testing for HIV emerge as key prevention strategies with a strong emphasis on staying HIV negative. Sometimes these messages seem to go awry, as the example of stay HIV negative, stay HIV positive. In South Africa, there's no medical male circumcision listed. Um, and you can see that in Zambia, there was a much bigger pot of prevention options, but also a more moral tone to the prevention options. And in Zambia, both counseling and more casual transmission routes were often listed, as well as more traditional um, prevention methods like stopping sexual cleansing, which is a, a practice of uh, having sex with a widow after the husband's died. And taking ARVs, again, just to emphasize, was always linked to PMCT. In Zambia, participants were more optimistic about HIV um, prevention than in South Africa. So in South Africa, although they recognized the biomedical effectiveness of some methods, they explained how impractical um, these were in their context and sometimes in their own culture. In both countries, condom use was regarded as the most practical prevention option at hand if used often, they said, correctly and consistently. And male condoms were available, although not plentiful. Uh, female condoms were not either well-stocked or popular. And in fact, in many of the Zambian sites, women were making bracelets out of uh, female condoms. Male condom use is, um, however, challenged by use in marriage, where it's a strong symbol of mistrust, which can result in violence against women, concerns about poor storage and quality, about side effects of lubricants, um, the, the challenges of using condom use after drinking, and the desire for live, what they call live or skin-to-skin -skin penetrative sex. 
Medical male circumcision was much more acceptable in Zambia than in South Africa. In Zambia, the promotion of medical male circumcision has linked it quite cleverly, in a sense, to cervical prevention of cervical cancer in women, as well as reduced risk of HIV transmission. And with the exception of older men, who saw it as being appropriate only for certain tribal ethnic groups, um, and not appropriate for them because they were older, most people, including women, were very open to medical male circumcision and relatively well informed. There were, however, limited medical male circumcision services and some concerns about how young circumcised men in particular considered themselves as fully protected against HIV and subsequently were taking more sexual risks. And I think the final comment about maybe from two men's groups um, about what about are we going to have anything to cut women is a reflection of both of male hegemony and how prevention tools are often subsumed by power relations um, in that context. In South Africa, um, it was hard to even talk about medical male circumcision, um, particularly with the COSA um, groups. And traditionally, COSA practice uh, male circumcision as a rite of passage into manhood. And participants talked about going to the mountains or we're still going to the bushes. And this has become a very politicized issue in South Africa. And it's very much regarded, the imposition of medical male circumcision is regarded as symbolic, as being imposed on by the West and their tradition and culture being challenged and is not considered appropriate. Um, however, there are other racial groups that are more open to medical male circumcision. Information um, amongst participants was very scant. And I think this cartoon portrays very nicely, with a lot of humor, the tension between the different male circumcision efforts. I now want to explore um, what the linkages there were and maybe were not between treatment and prevention. Firstly, um, participants were unfamiliar with the acronyms TASP, UTP, TCP, and TEST and TREAT. Um, in, in, in Zambia, there were a very small number of, uh, of Zambian sites where participants were familiar with, with PEP, and this was related to use by health workers who'd been exposed to blood, um, the use amongst rape cases, and also, interestingly, within discordant couples. Uh, there was two sites in Zambia said that, that said they'd heard on the radio about the use of Travada um, outside Zambia, and one person living with HIV, a woman, uh, mentioned prevention with positives, but all the participants were familiar with PMTCT acronym. So this, these quotes are an example of, of what I just said, UTT, what kind of animal is that? So on the whole, um, or very widely actually, participants were very widely supportive of encouraging everyone to test for HIV and most were open to early initiation of art. In Zambia, um, PMTCT was acknowledged as having reduced infant mortality and strongly advocated. In South Africa, uh, participants pointed out that PMTCT had not stopped the mother getting infected since she was already infected, and it was therefore regarded as a more secondary prevention strategy. Also, some felt that even if the child was protect protected from HIV at birth, they would grow up to face the same risks as the mother and subsequently become infected with HIV. Interestingly, the CEPO2 participants only discussed prevention in relation to PMTC. And recounting um, in the next slide, it shows you how they recount the value um, of PMTCT, but also record the loss of children um, prior to accessing PMTCT. In two Zambian sites, the, there were, the health workers had had contact with particular research studies and through that were aware of the impact of art on HIV transmission. And then there was one older women's group in a South African site that was also aware of reduced viral 
load once people living with HIV were taking pills. However, there was some concern that this could lead to people living with HIV stopping treatment. And the one group of health workers in Zambia advocated that it was wise to first observe and do research in this area before making it a more national strategy. So when we sort of pushed respondents to reflect more on the link between treatment and prevention, often this led to a discussion about preventing illness, about reducing viral load, and about boosting the immune system. And very occasionally, this was linked to reducing transmission to others, as reflected in these two quotes, one from South Africa and one from Zambia. And when we ask them more specifically about prevent, preventing HIV transmission through sex, um, there was a concept of reinfection between people who both have HIV um, as well as, um, and, and why then it was necessary to use condoms in these uh, interactions. And they also raised the issue of discordant couples and of PEP, the possibility of PEP. Um, and then one point that came out quite often was that when you link treatment to prevention, it seems to be at odds with behavior change messages which have been drummed into these populations for so long. And, and it was almost like people found it hard to break away from the need for sexual behavior change. And then they quickly sort of slipped into a more moralizing discourse around behavior change that was needed to accompany treatment. Um, in both countries, and particularly in Zambia, there was a very strong focus on casual transmission of HIV. And this seems to be an attempt to disassociate the link between being infected with HIV and improper sex as was reflected in, in the quote here. I mean, I think the focus on casual transmission is also a reflection of the environment um, of poor sanitation and lack of control over a pretty crummy environment in some situations. So to move on to the concept of, of science, um, so despite the caution about treatment as prevention at population level, given both the sort of strained or weak health systems and also the over-optimistic modeling that led to the concept, it's often presented more as a truth claim. There's also a risk of slippage of tipping the scales from treatment to prevention or indeed prevention to treatment. Um, and just, I wanted to flag that in Zambia and South Africa, there are other claims from alternative paradigms. So that art is not, not only, or not always the first treatment option for people living with HIV. We also saw some evidence that there's an emerging black market around ARVs as they get used for in alternative ways. So, these alternative paradigms sometimes draw on biomedical terms, techniques, and substances. An example of that would be um, traditional, male circum medical male, uh, traditional male circumcision in Zambia using a local biomedical anesthetic. Um, but also these alternative paradigms are attractive because the biomedical path doesn't offer a cure because it's tricky, as, as I've demonstrated, and also because it can be uncertain. And these alternatives tend to focus more strongly on healing and cure than on prevention. And they're very suppressed in Zambia and South Africa by the biomedical rhetoric, and often both hard to see and hard to talk about. So claims of a cure came from different corners. Firstly, faith itself is regarded as essentially protective in both countries. In other words, by adhering to what the Bible tells you, then your HIV risk is immediately very low. Secondly, faith healing is a very common social practice in all the Zambian sites, less so in South Africa. And in these faith healing sessions, both directly and indirectly, um, the possibility of cure is, is discussed and promoted. And some pastors actually actively advocate throwing away ARVs after healing sessions. 
Traditional healers were usually more cautious in claiming that they could cure HIV. Um, there were some instances of this, but not many. Um, one Rastafarian healer in South Africa claimed that the ARVs contained our herbs. Um, and a more worrying claim of cure, which we heard from in two sites, was the, d the myth that HIV can be cured through sex with a virgin or with a girl child. Immune boosters are available in all communities, um, not as much as they were back in 2004 when we also did research, but, but they're still there. And these are a mix of herbal and other substances. In Zambia, there's, there's an immune booster called Sondashi formula, which is particularly popular and sometimes regarded as a cure. And it's also said to have been subjected to clinical trials. In practice, immune boosters and herbs are used alongside ARVs and also um, as an alternative to ARVs. Um, and traditional healers, particularly in Zambia, particularly those who belong to associations or have been directly engaged in HIV training, um, say that they do refer people living with HIV to biomedical health facilities while still managing some of the side effects with their own methods. So many people living with HIV in Zambia seem to contemplate faith healing. Um, and, and, but they also, many of them recall people living with HIV that knew, they knew, or indeed themselves, being pronounced cured, stopping ARVs, and then subsequently either dying or falling extremely ill. And one key informant talked about how pastors who instruct... Um, sorry. Sorry, I've lost a <laughs> slide here. That, this is the cartoon I was looking for. So the instructors, um, pastors who instruct people living with HIV to throw away drugs are sometimes taking the drugs themselves. So we heard about this in our research, and then this cartoon came out just last week in the paper, which illustrates the point. Um, so alternative uses of ARVs were evident in both countries. Um, recreational use was particularly evident in larger communities in Zambia. So ARVs are smoked or, or sniffed um, and sometimes combined with other recreational drugs. Um, and in all South African communities, we heard about this. Um, in Zambia, we also heard about um, ARVs being fed to chickens to make them big. Um, and also in one site as a skin bleaching product. So these alternative uses of art are both practiced and contested. And I, this is reflected in the quotes here about faith healing, um, which, which would sort of demonstrate what, what I've just presented. So finally, if we look at stigma, um, it appears that the concept of art as prevention acts as a catalyst to highlighting the association between having HIV and irresponsible or improper behavior. And it also prompted participants to raise the possibility that people living with HIV, both on art and not on art, are vindictively spreading HIV to others. So on the one hand, HIV stigma was said to have reduced by many participants because of art. And if we look at the CEPO2 um, participant data, it shows that being on art was a powerful tool for both coping with and challenging stigma. So participants described um, their ability to sort of turn on stigma once their health had been regained, and they would do that by either, by either directly challenging stigma or, or experience having those that stigmatize turn to them for help. However, um, the fact that, that people living with HIV are now around for longer because of treatment, the visibility of HIV services, and um, indeed treatment as prevention itself, seems to have enhanced HIV stigma in both new and old forms. So CEPO2 participants didn't talk about not anticipating or not experiencing stigma. Rather, they explained how they challenged stigma and they remained very 
cautious about who they disclose their status to. So two examples of forms of stigma related to art. One is in the queue. Um, so on the one hand, queues are seen as evidence, queues at art clinics in South Africa and Zambia, uh, of reduced stigma, as, as reflected in the first quote. But on the other hand, standing and waiting in queues or hanging around the art clinic is, is, is often instigates um, sort of fears and experiences of stigma for people living with HIV, as illustrated in the second two quotes. And in addition, treatment as prevention appears to have increased the moral tone and authority around both treatment and prevention, with the onus being on people living with HIV to do the right thing and to contain the transmission of the virus, and often giving the others the right to tell people living with HIV how to live. And so there is a real risk that treatment as prevention itself could and is creating stigma and redrawing that boundary between us and them that we've worked so hard to pull down. So in conclusion, the evidence from this research in Zambia and South Africa suggests that in the process of pushing treatment as prevention as a strategy, that could turn the tide at population level is that the realities or, or silos um, is, it are not one-dimensional, as one participant put it. It's not just about taking a pill for life. It's rather about taking a pill or pills alongside many other realities and challenges. It also appears that in reality, treatment and prevention are not experienced as being closely linked, with the exception of PMTCT. And in our attempt to link them within this concept, treatment as prevention, we run some risks of slippage in our focus on both. So I've highlighted under science the risk of biomedical ideology and of overlooking alternative practices. And under stigma, the risk of driving stigma by putting the onus on the responsibility of people living with HIV to stop the transmission of HIV through proper behavior. So I would suggest that if, if TASP doesn't fit context and doesn't fit experience, then let's rethink. So it's time to consider stopping to promote concepts through new acronyms. We should work rather on providing people with detailed information. I mean, I'm fascinated by the amount of information here about side effects of treatment for people living with HIV. I've never, ever seen that information in Zambia um, available to people living with HIV. So those, that's the kind of detailed information that people need. I think we could also think about working within existing acronyms, as one research participant suggested, ABC. D. We should de-link treatment and prevention concepts and put focus on each one, since other than PMTCT, treatment and prevention are experienced and dealt with separately, and responses to both can be both particular and local. And finally, we should be careful of the risks of slippage away from treatment to prevention, since we might lose sight of the struggle with suffering in a broader sense of the existence of alternatives and critically heap the focus and blame on people living with HIV as well as on other vulnerable groups, falling back into the us and them scenario. The responsibility for prevention is broader than people living with HIV. So just to finally um, acknowledge again the teams um, that I work with in Zambia and South Africa for the pop art study, the, the PIs, the participants, the ministries of health and government departments, and to acknowledge the funding from various sources for pop art, and to acknowledge the SEPO2 study that's funded by CIHR and two um, colleagues who are present here, as well as others in Zambia and elsewhere. Um, and to give special acknowledgement to this group of individuals, as well as to Adrian Kuta, who gave me some literature, for helping me shape this presentation today. Thank you. Uh, 
in, in one minute, I invite you to bridge yourself over to the coffee break that's going to happen at the exhibition hall at the convention center. But first, I would like to invite you to join me in thanking Ginny for what was a provocative and incredibly thoughtful journey, evidence-based journey, to help us think differently about our own work here. Thank you.